let's go to the second big point that we will be discussing about in this, in this panel. And it's a zoom on the public-private partnership, how the governments and the governmental structures manage to articulate, to coordinate their work with the private sector companies. And let me come back to Professor Kazachkin. And uh, from a strategic point of view, Professor, how important is this articulation between these two worlds that sometimes struggle to work together, but when they manage to do it, they really crack the code in terms of, in of efficiency? Um, <clears throat> yes, thank you, Lelio. I fully agree. Um, and I'm a public, a public sector person, and I come from the world of international organizations. But uh, let me be very clear on your question. Public-private partnership is the only way uh, in which we can optimally achieve everything we want from, in the case of diagnostics that we discussed today, innovation, development, manufacturing, availability, quality control, availability and access. Uh, at each of these steps, each of these steps is optimally achieved by public-private cooperation. Um, if, of course, the partnership is really a partnership, that, that is, if partners behave as partners, uh, each of them doing whatever domain he's best at, which means that um, that cooperation has to be achieved through pre-negotiated contractual agreements between the two sectors. Um, and that opens the road. Um, from a public health um, and, and public sector um, perspective, of course, um, what we need at the end is regulation. Regulation of prices. Uh, I can't imagine living prices to the wild market as we see in the US. I think coming from Europe and also from the perspective of international organizations, I believe in regulation of prices. And we need, of course, regulation in order to ensure the quality of the product. And that is something that the public health sector is best at doing from its independency uh, of where it stands at national level and at uh, international level. So um, public-private partnerships fundamental to achieve the goals. Uh, and if we talk about infectious diseases and pandemics to come, uh, let's not forget that at the very start, the sequence of the virus, of the agent, and here the sequence of the new coronavirus, was immediately, and we should acknowledge, immediately within the first days of January 2020, put in the public space by China. And this is a lesson learned from previous pandemics. That hadn't been the case with some of the influenza pandemics, if you remember. But since then, the world has come together with what we call the international health regulations. And the sequence of that new virus is considered as a global public good. Uh, you, Dr. Leeds, said yet that you had access to that sequence within the first 15 days of January 2020 and could then have developed tests by the end of January 2020. So um, a public good is then transformed into an accessible, available tool and good for the public by the partnership. But everyone has to play the game and make sure that the ultimate goal is, the, is consider this as a global public good. Now, I was privileged to serve on the independent panel that was convened by the World Health Assembly to evaluate the COVID-19 response. And we have argued that uh, in responding to future pandemics, we need to reform the international health regulations 
in such a way that there is full understanding by everyone in every country in the world that something like a sequence is a global public good and also that public-private partnership have to develop in such a way that it will allow an end-to-end -end system so that there isn't a siloed, a first siloed that focuses on developing whatever will happen after it's developed, another silo focusing on manufacturing, a third silo or a third set of partners uh, working on accessibility. You have to think from the start the end-to-end -end system from innovation to access. From the international perspective, we now have a number of agencies and organizations that help the process and that are, interestingly enough, public-private partnerships. One is UNITAID uh, that was really a precursor in bringing innovation to access but I think Dr. Ngo and, and yourself, Lelio, you're, you're much better placed than I am to speak of UNITAID. But let me just say uh, two, three words on the Global Fund, uh, which uh, I, I know well, and uh, which is a partnership from the start in terms of governance, in terms of funding uh, resources, and a partnership that aims at delivering that global public good and uh, making uh, diagnostics, uh, treatments available for HIV, TB, malaria, now more and more COVID-19 as well, uh, to, to countries. It's a huge organization that disburses $4 billion per year. And it's uh, the interesting point I'd like to, to, to focus on here is that it is there to respond to the needs of countries Countries will come and express their needs. We need this and that diagnostic tool for our program. The requests from the countries would be reviewed by an independent international expert panel so that this will allow the national program and the request from the country to sort of be shaped in such a way that it meets the best international standards at the time. And then, of course, if you think of the volume at which the Global Fund may procure goods, be it tests, diagnostic tests, or therapies, uh, pooled procurement and other mechanisms uh, that I won't go into the detail of really allow also to obtain better prices. So here we have an example of a public-private partnership that has helped to take available products and make uh, them accessible at high quality and affordable prices to the public. So the essence of my message is, again, from the very first step to the end access, think end-to-end -end and think public-private working together. Thank you, Professor. Just a little follow-up question, very briefly, on a specific element of the strategy of the Global Fund for collecting, for, re for resource mobilization. We know that the private sector plays operationally with the Global Fund in the countries, but they, they are also in its governance, they're members of the board, and their role as money do do donation and, and uh, resource mobilization. Can you talk a little bit about the red product? What is it? Oh, the red product is, um, I think, a remarkable idea that was brought in uh, somewhere in the 2007, 2008, I think. And the red product is a group of, um, brings together a group of companies, um, you know, uh, Apple uh, telephones, here is my red uh, Apple phone, uh, or uh, Starbucks that uh, would allow you to have a red card to buy um, your coffee, or um, uh, Banana Republic, whatever. These companies come together and they commit 
to select some of their products. And if a consumer would buy one of these products, a part of the um, money that the consumer will pay will actually go and contribute to the global fund and therefore to the global public good. So it is a way of building the awareness of the consumer, but also um, bringing significant resources. Uh, I do not have updated figures uh, 2021, but I remember uh, like 10 years ago, r the red products after three, four years had brought close to $300 million to the Global Fund. Thank you very much. A club of companies getting together, launching products, dedicated products to contribute to a global response. What a good example of globalization serving a global need. A global need that will come back because we know that COVID-19 is not the last epidemic. We will be experiencing new outbreaks and possibly new pandemics. Dr. Go, after your long experience in the Korean CDC, do you think we are prepared for the next pandemic? What about next pandemic preparedness? Yeah, as, thank you very much, Mr. Delio Mamora. As we all witnessed the last two years, the health systems are under huge pressure with, uh, while COVID spreads across the globe so quickly, especially in the areas of hospital capacities, healthcare workers, shortage of personal protective equipment, uh, oxygen and ventilation, and diagnosed test kits. As this COVID-19 pandemic spread more rapidly and showed higher mortality compared to 2009 influenza pandemic, you asked us whether we prepared well. I think we need to prepare from now for the next pandemic, for disease X pandemic with various scenarios. Even in worst case, like with higher transmissibility, with similar or higher severity, in that case, the laboratory testing, contact tracing, and quarantine will be very critical component, especially in the early stage of pandemic. WHO has prepared for the risk of pandemic disease for many years. I worked there for three years. Before 2000 influenza pandemic, WHO developed pandemic influenza preparedness plan and encouraged countries to develop countries' own preparedness plan. I think it worked well. And WHO also uh, lead, lead the, uh, the, the role. And then pandemic influenza preparedness framework launched in 2011, bring together member states, industry, manufacturers, and other stakeholders to strengthen the sharing of influenza virus to increase the access to vaccines, especially in developing countries. As the importance of the increasing diagnostic testing capacity is highlighted in this COVID pandemic, I think uh, international organizations, including WHO, need to review the lessons learned in diagnostic field including the role of large-scale clinical laboratories in various countries. As Dr. Peterson mentioned, the best testing is uh, required this COVID pandemic first. So we need to review how has it contributed to coping with surging demand for testing capabilities? What was the mechanism of collaboration uh, between the large commercial clinical laboratories and public sector, and what will be their future role in detecting and surveillance of new emerging pathogens. Yeah? So, 
and then the, for expanding the laboratory capacities at global level quickly. I think we need to review these aspects. And UNITAID is also pioneering the accelerating the adoption and scaling up of new tools for TB, HIV, AIDS, and malaria in the country and played an important role in supporting the market entry of the new tools, uh, like uh, introduction of child-friendly TB drugs. And I saw that digital health tools has made significant advances during this COVID-19 pandemic worldwide in areas of surveillance, risk communication, contact tracing, quarantine monitoring, laboratory testing, and result communication, telehealth and telemedicine solutions. I think that uh, to prepare for the pandemic, I think the United role is important because they are pursuing the innovative solutions solution tools, so I think UNITAID will be uh, important. I'm expecting their new roles, and uh, Mr. Delio Mamora, former executive director, may have a big clear opinion on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Go. You embarrassed me with, uh, with, with, with well, I will give you uh, very quickly an overview of what UNITAID does. As, as, as Professor Kazachkin and Dr. Go explained, UNITAID is an investment fund to make catalytic investments and facilitate and accelerate the commercialization, the market penetration of health innovations. And let me explain how UNITAID works very quickly with one example. Until five years ago, there was no pediatric treatment for tuberculosis. Why? Because in the countries where we invent the treatments, you don't have children with tuberculosis, or you have very few. So the industry, not having a market, never managed to, or never had the incentive to develop a uh, pediatric treatment for TB. But in Africa, you have 250 thousand kids every year dying because of tuberculosis. So at UNITAID, we started noticing that these children were treated with adult doses, breaking the pills, crushing them, and mixing them with water or with milk. And the flavor is so bitter that these children would not accept it or vomit it, and then interrupt treatment, and then become uh, uh, resistance with probably the possibility of a multidrug resistant TB. So huge challenge and we made a call to the industry asking who is capable of developing a fixed dose combination pediatric TB treatment. And one company came and said we, we can do that. And I asked the CEO, we need a nice flavor. Which flavor do you want? Strawberry. With strawberry, you cannot, you cannot get it wrong. Every child everywhere in the world likes the strawberry flavored. So in 11 months, they brought the fixed dose combination with an investment of $35 million, which is not a huge investment for the numbers we are, we're talking. Today, five years later, six years later, this product is being used in more than 80 countries in the world. That is one example of UNITAID making a catalytic investment for either creating a product that is needed but it's not produced or facilitating an existing product to go to the market at affordable prices. Another good example is the HIV self-test. We managed to bring a test that normally costs more than $40 in the US to the African countries for $3 making a volume guarantee and a deal with, uh, with, um, with the manufacturer. Very interesting points, Dr. Go, about three elements that are extremely important, that are the basis of the country's strategies. Cost, quality, and access. 